side drifting, boondogging, whatever you want to call it. You're throwing your offering out into the current. You're basically doing what this did, but you're doing it in faster water. If you take a side casting rig and throw it out into your bobber hole, it's going to hit the bottom and it's not going to do nothing. We want current flowing to push it along. You can do this from the bank or you can do it from a boat. You don't have to have one. You don't have to have a boat. You can do it from the bank. What you have to keep in mind with any of these is I need to be in the strike zone as long as I can. Percentages. Here I am fishing. I'm round. It's like me. Here's our river. When I throw out with my bobber, I throw up and I feed the line all the way down as far as I can. Keeps me in the strike zone. When I'm side drifting, I do the same thing. Because if you don't, here's what happens. If I throw my bobber out or my side, I throw it here, I close the bale, I keep the slack out as it comes around because I don't want a big loop of line in there because I won't be able to set the hook when the bobber goes down. If I get to here and I don't let it out, it goes right back to the shore, right? Well, now I, I could have drifted down here another 50, 60 yards. So I got it. Once it gets down in front of me, I flip my bale and I shake my rod tip and I just let the line kind of feed off nice and slow. I don't want to be jerking that. I see guys mending, whoa, and the bobber's pulling and turning. Well, there may be a fish looking at it right when you did that. You know, just kind of shake it, lift it up a little bit, nice and subtle, so that bobber's just nice and smooth. Side drifting's no different. When we bobber fish, we want to use a spinning reel, correct? Some guys don't like to. Chad, Chad will use both. I like to use a spinning reel because when it goes down, I can just shake my rod tip and feed the line out. If you got a good high quality bait caster, you back the brake off, it can still pull it out or you can go like this and feed it. Personal preference. I like the spinning reel, smoother approach. When I'm side drifting, I want a bait caster. I want a bait caster. When I throw up, I may not be able to throw way up here. Because if I got current coming like this, what happens? The further up you throw, it pushes down on the rocks faster and you're going to get hung up a bunch. So where the bobber is nice is now I can throw way up here. I may have to do this kind of an angle here. So if I know that sweet spot is down in here, I don't want to be standing on it. Remember we want to get to them. So I want to be above it. I want to throw up here. I'm going to feed it down. I'm going to keep my rod tip up. As I start to go down, I start to lift my brake and let it go tink, 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 and let it pull out. Keep a tension on it. Don't let it bird nest. Feed it down. Try to make that swing as long as I can. As long as I can. Reason why I like a bait caster for doing this, because usually you're casting a little more weight. I want something with a little faster gear ratio so I can get down there and set the hook. Because my line is now in the water, I've got drag pulling against it, need a little stiffer rod, a little more backbone. I'm not floating on top, I'm down underneath. So I like my bait caster. Eight and a half foot, something a little medium heavy, maybe heavy, faster action because we need the sensitivity, right? A lot of times I'll run the stealth, 20 pound stealth when I'm side drifting. Braided line, no stretch. I can feel the difference between a rock and a bite. Tap, 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 tug. Tug is that weight, that's the fish. It's the hardest thing to deal with when you start side drifting. What is a bite and what is not? Side drifting rigs, <clears throat> guys, they're like spinners for walleyes. There's so many combinations, we don't have enough hours in the day. So, let's talk about first where we're going to position ourselves, then we'll talk about what we're going to use. Remember how I drew before this deep pocket right here? I said there was a riffle here, and then it went kind of slack. Right now we're sitting in here. We're waiting for some water. If it warmed up and it started to run, I would get up in here and I'd start side drifting. Reason being is now we've got fish coming through. They're moving. We're trying to intercept them as they move. The percentage spot now becomes here because these fish are spreading out. They're no longer as concentrated. They're coming through the top of that riffle, heading to the next spot because they need to get there before it starts to drop again and get cold. 
When you get into these riffles like this, five, six feet of water, eight feet of water, whatever it may be, and in a boat, sometimes you can drift, side drift deeper water. As you got the boat moving, and you can just kind of pair up and go down. From the shoreline, not as lucky. So generally, I tend to do this when I'm fishing a shallower spot. I got a riffle going through there. I got some gravel going through there. Side drifting tends to be most popular when the fish are coming into the system in the fall. And then once again in the spring, or late winter, when it starts to warm up. And the water's a little muddy and they're starting to move. They're on their move. So now we're trying to intercept them where they're coming through rather than where they're resting. It's not to say you can't still catch some here. It's just better to do it this way. <coughs> Prime example. Doubt the South Fork. Did our stuff. Made our, made our show. Went back down there about two weeks later where we had caught six fish in about two hours and did the show couldn't buy a fish on a jig and bobber went up to a riffle did another show that fast had changed just because the water got muddy and it came up using the right presentation for what the conditions are telling you to do as spring approaches you'll see these fish coming through and what they're starting to do is they're starting to set up in areas where they want to nest at or they want to red they want to bed at You'll see them in shallow gravel bars. You'll be side drifting through those same shallow gravel bars. The water's moving. The bobber season for us is pretty much December through maybe middle of February. This year is going to be later because it's been so cold. Probably not going to thaw. Usually by end of February, side drifting. Side drifting, back trolling. Back trolling we'll get to. When they're moving through is when you want to back troll. Side. What's that? March till when? And, uh, yeah, March through well till it closes. Till it closes, which is like was it April 30th, I think. This is just a standard side drifting setup, guys. I said there's millions of these, millions of options. Basically, what it consists of, you've got a red octopus hook, you've got a chunk of yarn, and you've got a corky. These can be all sizes. They can be small, they can be big. Some of them have little wings on them, spinning glow. What you have to know about these is, why, okay, why do I use a bigger corky? Why wouldn't I use a smaller corky? Exactly. If I'm fishing in faster water, I need more flotation, because it's gonna blow this thing down the rocks and it's gonna get stuck. If I'm using a bigger egg sac that's got weight and I need to pick it up. I got to use a heavier one, or a bigger, excuse me, a bigger corky. Corky size depends on speed of water, just like picking a jig head when you throw it out, or picking the weight that you use when you're side drifting. Slow flow through the riffle, smaller corky. You just want it hovering right up off the bottom. You don't want it way up in the air like this. You just want it to hover. So once again, it's an experiment. You constantly got to be moving through. Now you know your progressions with your colors. If you've got muddy water, what color do you want to use, which is typically muddy when you're side drifting? Chartreuse, greens, okay. Typically that's what you want to run. If you've got a shallower riffle and it's a little dirty, the orange, they can still see it. Because remember, red's good to 30 feet. So they can still see it. So typically your oranges and your reds, or your chartreuse, excuse me, will be the colors that you'll run. I said there's a pile of them. Go look at the sports shop. There's hundreds of different combos, just like making jig heads. A lot of different combos. You gotta make your move, progressions through them. There's glow ones, okay? Get it? There's a bunch of different styles. Now usually what'll happen with these, Snake River, it's popular, more popular than I'd say on the clear water, but the snake is more popular to take those shrimp that we talked about and just put a piece of shrimp on there and side drift with the shrimp. The clear water seems to be more of an egg bite. What I think it has to do with is that you have to think of the egg bite coming on when the spawn starts to happen. Later in the season when they start dumping eggs, eggs will always work better than the shrimp will. So earlier, typically earlier is when the shrimp thing happens. The big thing now is the sand shrimp. You've probably all seen the sand shrimp in the store in the little containers. Most of those ones that you buy in the sporting goods shops, they're dead. 
because they're not taken care of properly. If you want to do the sand shrimp thing versus the standard shrimp, you need to order them from somebody on the coast, have them flown in because they're fresh that day. To take care of those guys, what you need to do, best way you can keep them, the guys will try to keep them in the water and they'll change the water and do all that. What breaks them down, guys, is when they urinate. Once they do that and they start urinating and that gets on the flesh of the shrimp, it puts a bad flavor out there and they're going to cause you negative effects. What the best thing to do is lay them down in a layer, take a wet paper towel, put it on the bottom, put your first layer down, the next wet paper towel on top of that, and the next layer. Then you change out your paper towels once a day. They're going to last you about three days. So if you want to use a sand shrimp, we're going to talk about rigging sand shrimp in a minute. That's how you keep track of them, take care of them. it was in the paper that Idaho was going to outlaw live shrimp. They're wanting to do it because the problem with it is that they'll eat it. They'll take it all the way down in. And when you're working with catch and release stuff, you can't release them. That's the main concern. Because what happens with those guys, as Mickey can attest to you, they hit and they hit and you just, they just keep letting them hit. Bang, 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 until the rod loads up. You know, they're not eating, but they're, gonna, they're working it down there. Or with a typical shrimp, as soon as you get the bite, boom. And what happens is when it's being back trolled, not so much side drifted, because the side drift, you feel the weight of the fish right away, and you hook it. When you're back trolling a plug with a diver set up, and this guy hooked to your plug, and the plug's down here dancing around, and this is like the walleye spinner, remember how I tied that up? Same principle here. You just sit there and let it wait, let it wait, let them eat it. Let them eat it, let it eat it. Well, they get it down there, and you set the hook, and there's all kinds of bad things that happen. So that's the concern is allowing them to eat it too long. All those fish, guys, that snake and clear water systems, man, we gotta take care of those fish. Well, that's, that's why that's coming up like that.